Hello everyone, this is Venom Geek Media here, and today I'm going to do a bit of a deep dive into another ship, much like I did with the Connie and Excelsior class. Uh, we're going to look at a ship today which started out looking extraordinarily fearsome, the most deadly and, and respectable ship, that quickly became cannon fodder. And of course, those of you will know that I am talking about the Jem'Hadar fighter. And while some of this might da be down to technological developments and, you know, the, the novelty wearing off somewhat, I still think it's worth going into a little bit more. Why does this happen? Why does it lose this sort of feared status? It's not like they were completely countered by the Federation working out how to defend against the Polaron beams. The Dominion still took over much of the Federation uh, just with these ships and the battle cruisers, of course, but the Dominion fleet is mostly these ships, and uh, if they were just reliant on this gimmick weapon, well, then they wouldn't have nearly destroyed the entire Federation. So, so first thing I want to talk about with the Jem'Hadar fighter is the structure of it. You see, uh, despite being called a bug ship, it's really technically more of an arachnid in as much as you've got two distinct sections. You've got the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. Insects generally, uh, or other arthropods, have generally three sections. You have a head, middle, back. Spiders and scorpions both have a body and an abdomen. So, much like how with Federation designs, you have the clear sort of science habitation section in the saucer section and you have all the greasy smelly engineering stuff down in the uh, engineering section and never the two shall meet apart from in the neck but we can take that approach to the Jem'Hadar ship in much the same way although the considerations are perhaps a little bit different uh, the Dominion doesn't put so much emphasis on uh, health and safety you, you might have noticed what we have in the the head section, or the thorax, are basically all your primary systems. Your power, your weapons, and even your warp drive. Now then, of course, you have... Technically, it's a separate section, but it basically it's part of the abdomen. It's there to protect the abdomen. You have the uh, armor shell. Those two sort of beetle-like plates which are a combination of fuel, radiator systems, and armor, or a kind of a soft armor. We'll get onto how that factors in as an armor a little bit later. And then finally, you have the abdomen, which is essentially your cargo and impulse unit. That's literally all that's in there. So one of the things you've got to think is actually, this has even less habitable space than we originally thought. This probably has less habitable space than a Klingon bird of prey. Yeah, tight confines, because you're basically just looking at that four section. Now, granted, a little bit of the design of the habitable space, you need to factor in that the decks are probably um, on an angle, because, you know, grav plating can do that. It's very handy like that. So, probably they are a bit more efficient with the use of space than a lot of orthos uh, and deck plans will give them credit for. But even then, you're still not working with very much here. It's also worth pointing out that the windows on the CGI model are, of course, a lie. But one of the interesting things is that the Jem'Hadar fighter, compared to a lot of other attack ships, has a very square, very flat profile. It's square from top down, so it's neither longer than it is wide. It is pretty much perfectly sort of square in that respect. And, of course, it's about as flat as a pancake. There's no sort of dangly hanging off bits that can be uh, isolated and targeted and focused. It's all just sort of one shape. So what we really have here is a ship that is very quick to build because it's two main sections plus your armor plates. And basically what it is built out of is a series of very advanced but also very simple components. And what do I mean by that? Advanced but simple components. Well, Let's take the example of the warp core. You see, uh, the warp core is a spherical warp core. It's a spherical annihilation core. So, basically, what we have here is two spheres. And these are molecularly homogenous. They are atomically homogenous. These are perfect structures. 
which means they're incredibly stable and can handle the fact that there's a matter-antimatter going on inside them. So you have the inner sphere, which is the main reactor chamber. Of course, it opens on the top and bottom for the uh, matter and antimatter injectors. But aside from that, it's completely homogenous, perfect, and it's a cast piece. But it's cast in such a way that, of course, it allows through the energy, the radiation generated by the matter-antimatter reaction. And so that filters through, sort of think about it like a sort of semi-porous membrane, that filters through the, the structure of the inner sphere and out to the secondary sphere, which contains the plasma. And that then heats up the plasma. There's no dilithium involved here. There's no plasma coolant. It's raw and it's efficient. A hundred percent of the matter and antimatter is annihilated in this reaction. And they can also use containment fields to manipulate. So basically, even when you get into the reaction chamber, the matter and antimatter, much like in a photon torpedo, will be held apart and then amounts will then mix in the middle and that amount will depend on how much power the ship is in need of. That's basically all there is to it. So you see what I mean where I say it's a very com it's a very advanced but very simple part. Much like, you know, how you have cast armor with tanks and that was an advancement over riveted armor or welded armor, but it's actually simpler as a manufacturing process, but it's more advanced. It's that kind of thing. So that kind of philosophy underpins most of the other systems in the Jem'Hadar attack ship, is that they're all operating on things that are very simple. Once you get that capability to produce them up and running, they're very simple to produce, but they are complex pieces of equipment that had a lot of science and, uh, and technology go into it. Now, this, as I say, has two advantages. One, the reactor generates no byproduct. Two, it runs very hot. This has advantages and disadvantages. Uh, it means it can perform uh, very high. It means that it has a very high end performance envelope. You can ask a lot of this engine and it will deliver. But that also means, much like when you put your foot to the floor, you're going to see that fuel gauge go very sadly drop very quickly so you know obviously most of the time you're not going to run it that hard um now in so doing you of course have to plasma how do you keep the, how do you regulate uh your plasma now on larger ships you of course have plas plasma conduits basically step down step up transformers you also have plasma coolant systems now the Gemini don't use plasma coolant so what instead they do is they use the outer shell as a radiator. Basically, anytime you've got excess plasma or excess energy running through the system, you just shunt it out to the radiators and just let the plasma run around in those radiators until eventually it runs out of energy. Now, of course, there's only so much those radiators can contain. And, you know, if you've overheated, you've overheated, you've not, you know, you've pressed your override button and now you're in a situation where your ship is going to blow up. Well, that's kind of on you. But frankly, the Dominion don't mind. If you blew up in the process of fighting the enemy and doing as much damage as you could, that's fine by the Dominion. So having those radiators allows you to... That's what allows the Jem'Hadar fighter to punch so much above its weight. That's also why the Defiant punches so much above its weight. It's mentioned that the Defiant almost sh shook itself apart on its first trial, and it's also likely that even if it didn't shake itself apart, it would overheat. Remember, in space, uh, no one can conduct your heat away. So once you start building up heat, you've got to do something yourself to deal with that. So you've got to go and, and find a way to keep yourself cool. And one of the ways the Defiant does that is, of course, with those uh, plasma vents on the top, those circular plasma vents. And similar to the Jem'Hadar fighter, and similarly the Jem'Hadar fighter has the big radiators, which allow it to disperse that plasma and allows a bit more tolerance in the system for an overload.
So I suppose now that we've been talking about the reactor, we should talk about the engines themselves. So of course we have our warp engines. These are tapered nacelles and these have a few advantages. They're quicker to charge uh, and they're harder to track. They sort of sew up space behind them. You'll notice that the Enterprise E has tapered nacelles. Tapered nacelles often sew up the space behind them so that they don't leave a huge gravitic wake where the ship has gone. And that means that you're just a little bit harder to track. It's not stealth per se. It's just a little bit to help you be a little harder to find. They have 12 warp coils, which is a good number. It's uh, not too many. And the coils themselves are relatively small, easy to replace. The more interesting thing here to talk about is the impulse system, given that that is how the Jem'Hadar fighter will be doing most of its fighting. It's an impulse. What we've got going on here is effectively a vent style exhaust system with two very very large impulse reactors so basically if you want to take that abdomen section and you want to sort of do a little division down the middle that's where the cargo bay is with the cargo bay hatch out of which you can emerge um, and then on either side on the port and starboard you're boxed in by the two impulse reactors so proportional to the size of the ship, those are some very, very large impulse reactors. And the fact that those are plasma vent style exhausts means that it has a little bit more in the way of, well, a protection. It protects the impulse drive, which is very important, considering that is basically how this ship is going to survive. So the vents help protect it more than a conventional impulse engine. They also allow for the vectoring of the impulse thrust, which allows it its maneuverability. Okay, let's talk weapons. So, in terms of ordnance, this is a very interesting one. The Jem'Hadar fighter has eight single-shot torpedo tubes there on either side of the primary hull. Now, you might be wondering why they just have eight single-shot torpedo tubes. Well, it's space efficient. It means that you don't have to have a magazine loading system and torpedo tube, you literally just pack in, like on a fighter, pack into those slots, those hard points, eight torpedoes, which for a ship of this size and given the missions it's going to be on, you're only ever going to need eight torpedoes. That should be plenty. It also means that you, you know, discourage profligate use of the torpedoes. So the crew is only going to use the torpedoes when they need to. And also it minimizes the losses. Torpedoes are pretty expensive things and you don't want to just go wasting them willy-nilly or having a ship go down with a lot of torpedoes on board. So keeping it down to eight and keeping those in separate isolated sections may also help contain ammunition explosions from spreading to the rest of the ship. It's a good design and it's very efficient and it does mean they could, if they wanted to, launch all eight at once and that's quite an unpleasant uh, thing to be on the receiving end of, although we never see it done, because of course the main weapon for the Jem'Hadar fighter is the Polaron phaser. There are two main emitters or arrays. You have an aft emitter, which is just a single emitter. The main emitter on the prow actually has three sub emitters, and that allows the beam to traverse a little bit port and starboard so that it can actively track targets and doesn't need to be, you know, doesn't need to be shooting at something bang on dead ahead, it can maneuver a little bit. This is an incredibly powerful weapon. It's about as powerful as a capital ship Type 10 phaser, maybe even a little bit more powerful. And it has an advantage over other attack ship weapons in that because it's a beam weapon, it can reach out at touch targets at medium range, which is very handy. But that would be completely useless if it wasn't for the fire control. Yes, we're talking about fire control again. Okay, so you have on top of the shell two primary range finders. You then have a set of tracking sensors above the bridge. And then a final targeting array on the nose. And there is a paired mirrored system on the underside of the primary hull. Although its aft sensors in that respect are kind of lacking. If you approach the Jem'Hadar fighter from aft below, you may be able to get into a targeting sensor blind spot and the and the Polaron phasers won't be able to shoot at you. This is a very narrow area and like 
in the reality in combat, getting there is going to be nigh on impossible when you've got a Jem'Hadar ship maneuvering. But it does mean that there is a sort of a, a moment of potential uh, cutoff where the Jem'Hadar ship can actually lose track of its target during a maneuvering battle, during a dogfight, if you stray into that area and then potentially pull some kind of maneuver, it'll take the Jem'Hadar fighter a little bit longer to find you again. Something to bear in mind. But ultimately, the fire control system is optimized for firing on the move. However, there's another feature, and that is that it's all tied into the communication array. And that allows for the networked targeting of both dispersed and uh, shared targets. Jem'Hadar fighters do not work alone. They, of course, work in groups of generally three. And then if we're talking on a larger scale, up to nine supported potentially by a battle cruiser. And in that instance, what you're dealing with is potentially you could either be engaging one singular target, like a galaxy class. Okay, great. But we've got to pick our targets. You, you know, if we're all just kind of shooting at the, the galaxy class generally... We're not being very efficient about it, you know, and potentially that risks the ship staying in the fight for longer and doing more damage to us. So we need to have an efficient means to prioritize targets and allocate specific systems and subsystems to target. Apply that when you're dealing with perhaps another squadron of attack ships and you've got to isolate what are the biggest threats. Okay, do we go for the Sabres? Do we go for the Defiance? Who do we go for which? How many ships do we allocate to this? This is all done by a networked fire control system, which is capable of, like I say, analyzing the threat, analyzing the data that is networked together by the fighters, and then calculating firing solutions for each fighter, as well as maneuver packages which enable the fighters to maneuver and stay evasive without also crashing into each other and without them having to be in such constant communication. And of course, there are, you know, automated systems on the fighter that kind of help prevent that. There are, of course, systems that prevent you crashing into your friends, hopefully, unless you've turned them off. This whole process is generally handled, can be handled in a squadron. It can be handled by a the lead fighter, and that's plenty enough because it's only coordinating three two other ships when we're talking about a full battle group and we're talking about n nine fighters that generally gets held handed off to a dominion battle cruiser that will be supporting them it's a little bit much to ask a single gem hadar fighter to manage the the uh fire control for eight other ships whereas a battle cruiser is well equipped to do that that's why the battle cruiser is so important so it's worth just bearing in mind that the computers and target management systems on the Jem'Hadar fighters are just as important as the weapons themselves now let's talk about defenses the Jem'Hadar fighter actually has some pretty strong shields due to its sort of disproportionate power output for its size it's also worth mentioning that these shields uh, at least when we initially encounter them, repel sensor beams. They don't make the ship invisible, they're not a cloaking device per se, but it makes it impossible for you to scan the ship, which means it's very difficult, again, to kind of isolate weak targets, you know, which ship is the weakest out of the group, who do we pick off first, or, you know, what subsystem is, is you know, exposed or whatever. You can't do that. So you just have to, again, shoot at the ship generally. So they don't allow you to do what they will do to you, which is, you know, use target analysis to prioritize and make sure they most they can engage you incredibly efficiently. They won't allow you that same luxury. There are also now soft defenses. So the radiator shell, that's a very important defense. Not only does it, of course, cover the... Uh, impulse units, which are very, very, very important. It also provides a bit of overhead aft cover for the prow section, perhaps concealing the weakest part of the prow section. And overall, it's durable, but not overly protected. It's not built like a tank, like the Hideki is. It's not so bulky and, and prioritized on protection that it can't um, it's it's as durable as it needs to be, and certainly it's more durable than a Klingon Borel. So 
that puts it in pretty good standing, but they are somewhat damage tolerant. Damage tolerant, not damage immune. And certainly, I, I don't want to get across that these are, you know, super fighters that are completely invulnerable. They are not. Their best means of survival is to kill you before you can shoot back. There's just also a couple other utilities I want to talk about. Um, you have the anti-proton scan, which allows it to detect cloaked ships. Very, very, very handy. Uh, almost game-breaking as far as the Alpha Quadrant felt initially. There are ways to avoid the anti-proton scan. Don't be there. That's generally the best way to do that. But it does certainly mean either you have to commit to the Romulan style of cloaking device, or the if you're the Klingons, you basically just have to give up cloak and dagger. Uh, they also have advanced transporters, in, at least initially, that can beam through shields. I'm, again, guessing that this is something that was eventually rectified by Starfleet, but I can still imagine it would be very useful to have the ability to beam through your own shields. That's very useful. It means you can still beam down troops to a target whilst things are perhaps still a little bit uh, spicy in orbit. It's got the option to uh, enter the atmosphere and deploy troops directly, which is perhaps more a psychological tactic than anything else. And it also has the ability, somewhat at least, to accept alien weaponry. They can fit the Breen energy damper to it. So there's a little bit of open, uh, open design, and that's probably the fact that the Dominion uses various alien components. In the design, it's a little bit like a modern main battle tank or aircraft, where it's got an Italian engine, a German computer, and a, a British gun, or, you know, whatever. I'm just sort of pulling names out of thin air but you understand the premise which is that it's it's got a composite of different systems already so it's not necessarily a homogenous system and that means that it's a little bit more upgrade tolerant in conclusion while there are a handful of standout systems you know everyone knows the the anti-proton scan everyone knows the the polaron beam None of these things are particularly advanced or impressive on their own. They're, they're good, but they're not particularly striking on their own. What it is, is, is the application, the use of this at scale. It's the incorporation of these systems into a wider system of systems, and that is what the Dominion has. They've made sure that these ships are coordinating and cohesive in how they approach a situation you know bear in mind these these are ships used by the the founders a uh, species which thinks and operates or likes to think and operate in perfect unity and harmony because they're they're sort of a they're a group of individuals yes but they're also homogenized as one in the great link and you can kind of see echoes of that in this very insectoid hive mind design Again, you have individuals, but they are networked together in such a way as to be most efficient and to multiply one another's firepower and capabilities. Ultimately, I think the Jem'Hadar warship, in the greatest sense, it is a warship. It's not like all these other ships that we've seen that are, you know, designed for one-on-one -on -one combat or ambush or patrol or scouting or anti-Borg activities. This is a warship. This is a ship you take to war, you bring it in numbers, you bring it in force, and it's designed to operate in a force. It's designed for a state that is constantly operating on a war footing and constantly expanding its borders. So there's a distinction between good enough and you know, it works. It works suggests you're just going to build it, send it out, and it's probably going to die. Good enough means that it actually stands a reasonable chance of survival, and that's what the Jem'Hadar warship has. That's why they're so efficient. If the Dominion was just sending these into wave upon wave of suicidal attacks, and they were just getting destroyed, well, the Dominion would not be as big as it is. It's as big and powerful as it is is because this ship is capable of operating far beyond what it should. While that's somewhat due to the technology and the um, individual systems, it's largely due to the networking and combining of these systems into a single force 
for war. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Leave your thoughts in the comments below. My voice is dying. 